as you're growing, finding the right people in the right seat is going to impact your business greatly so that you're not living your business, but you're working on your business. All right, everyone, welcome back to Master Life by Design. I'm excited for today's interview and our guest, Paul Gallagher. I'm excited to have him. He's going to bring a different twist to the show because a lot of who we've been interviewing has dealt with real estate. But Paul has a different background and his is more in business and even the, the specific niche that he was in in business, I think is going to really give some really good perspective for those of you that are looking to create business on your terms and how can help you create the life that you want. So, Paul, welcome for be, being here. Thank you for being here, should I say. So, welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Awesome. Me too. Well, let's jump on in. And I want to share, I want to, I'd love for you to just share your background, kind of where you started at a young age, how you got into business, and what was that journey like? So, floor is yours. Yeah, back in 2008, almost a, more than a decade ago, so I'm 33 now. I was 18, fresh out of high school. My friend, I was working various jobs, and my friend, who his coworker, asked him if he was work, if he wanted any extra work on the weekends. And he didn't. He was already having a lot, doing a lot. And he approached me. And it just so happened that it was people working with people with disabilities. And that's why my good friend Eric approached me and asked me. And I was very, I was very excited to say yes. And I start got interviewed. I started. Now, here's the deal. Within the 30 days that I started, I wanted to quit. I thought I was not equipped to, you know, uh, help someone toileting, changing. I was just like, this is too much. And I prayed. And after that 30 days, I was really just inspired. And I loved what I did. Now, a couple of years later, I was driving home from a community college that I was going to. And I was like, what do I want to do with my life? And it just came out of nowhere. I would like to think that God gave me the seed to the idea to start my own health, my healthcare company. And with that, a couple of years later at 23, I opened Genesis Home Care uh, in 2012. So you opened your own healthcare your facility at 23. Were you nervous? Were you scared? Were you just like oblivious and like, let's go after it, excited? Like, where was your mindset at? My mindset is I'll do whatever it takes, but I was scared shitless. I had no idea what I was doing. Running a business, what does that even entail? And so I had no idea, but I just knew that I wanted to do it. So I would do whatever it took. Awesome. So you're 23, you're nervous, uh, but you're hungry to get after it. So where do you, where'd you go from there? How'd it go? So after 20, when I was 23, I opened the business and there were some folks that I worked with uh, during my previous employment that wanted to come along with me. And I got the other business owner, what they call providers blessing to for have them transfer over my company. And so we provided around the clock care. So the way I was set up real briefly was they have their own home or house or condo. And we provided the staffing 24 seven for these individuals. And so we had a couple of folks that we took care of. And then the following year we had one more, another referral. And then we did really, really well with that. And then 2014, it blew up. We were getting referrals, opening new homes like once a month at very minimum. Wow. That's awesome. like opening, bringing people to go into their home or for you guys to get your own facility and have them come? So the home business model is, it's like a licensed group home, but it's more three, like three or four, sometimes two people that live on their own and receiving care. So it's not like your own, your own facility. They're actually moving away from that model to more individual care. Like even in the elder care, they're saying mom and dad want to stay home. Mm. In this case, the folks with disabilities, they want to live on their own. They get two or three or four people in a home and provide the care. That's great. That's awesome. That's great. So you guys started blowing up around 2014. Yes, because part of it was we were able to work with the most marginalized folks. And what I mean by that is people that where a lot of other providers or agencies did not want to take on because they were maybe aggressive, just very, very difficult. We took on those cases and did very well. That's how we established our name. Mm, very cool. Very cool. So here you are, you guys are starting to create this reputation. You're two years in, into it at this point. 
Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, where's your head at now? You're starting to make more money, have more growth, you're getting referrals. Where are you at? So one half of me is like, man, this is awesome. I'm living the dream. Another half of going, growing pains. Oh, how do I adapt? How do I change this? Like for instance, we used Intuit payroll, but you only can have a maximum of 50 employees. At our peak, we had 140 employees. Wow. So we had to change our whole entire payroll system. We, I didn't have a bookkeeper on staff for like a year and a half. So then I brought that on. And so now learning the business systems are like 25, 26. And that was huge. And making the care better and then having the, the back systems to support the growth that we were having. It was just needed, period. So <clears throat> would you recommend, now that you're down this path, you know, years down, would you recommend if someone's starting a business to really identify those key systems ahead of time for growth? Or do you think it's just something like as you work your way up, you're going to have to kind of, it's just a growing pain you're going to experience and it is what it is. I think the biggest thing is just identifying basic systems. Who would you use for a payroll provider? There's a lot of, there's so many. Don't get hung up on that. You just know that you'll need a payroll provider. Uh, same thing with maybe a phone system. Don't get caught up in the details. Just go with one. And as you are growing and scaling, systems are going to need to change. And you're going to learn, okay, maybe I need to price out, for instance, new insurance. So to answer your question directly, it would be just go. Don't spend a lot of time trying to do all the research and figure it all out. You're not going to be able to do that. And you're going to bug yourself down. Just say, okay, here's a solution for payroll. Okay, I'll go with it. And then after a year or two, if it's working well, great. If it's helping you grow and scale, great. If it's not, you're going to have to switch. Mm. So the so, systems are going to be ever evolving. Great. And so maybe even looking with a system that whatever you're looking for, whether it's insurance or anything or payroll, it has that capacity to scale with you. Exactly. And this is why franchise opportunities for people are so important. They like it so much because the systems are already there. Because mm -hmm. the reality is, systems are always going to evolve. New technology is going to come out. You might pivot to a certain uh, new product or service, and it's not going to be aligned with what you already have going on. So you might have to switch or get something new system. And then implementing that system, if you're a large corporation with 140 employees, now transitioning to a new system is going to be cumbersome. It's going to be a lot of work. Yeah. See, a lot of people that I've coached as a, they start out a solopreneur and then they're like, oh crap, I need help. And so just by default, they take on more people, right? And that allows them to make more money. And, and to eventually, depending on the outcome and their goals, the scale. And if they want to scale, they're thinking about how do I provide the service and make money but few times do they think about what are the systems that I need? And systems are so key if you want to be able to scale and, and have a life, right? Like, so tell me, you got 140 employees, you're changing, you're getting systems. Like, what was your time commitment for you in the business at that point? So one thing I caught on early on is that I don't want to do it myself. And so I created a team. One thing I realized that's a gift for me is leadership development. And I'm really good at delegating and empowering people. And what I did was have a great team around me. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't always have the right person in the right seat. So going back to what we just discussed a minute ago, as you're growing, finding the right people in the right seat is going to impact your business greatly so that you're not living your business, but you're working on your business. Yeah. And how, so that's a really good point. If you're trying to bring all these people in, how do you know if they're the right fit? What do you do? So the biggest thing, most important thing, number one, is culture fit. Competency you could teach. And like for instance, if you're hiring an HR person, you can see their resume, they might have experience. But if I have two applicants and one is has just amazing, a million years of experience, I can afford this person and they worked just amazing. And then I had this other person who has maybe three years of experience, but this person is just a culture fit through and through. Maybe they took a, a uh, personality assessment like DISC, for instance, but if we have our core values and if they fit those core values, that's a culture fit. 
I'm taking the person that has three years of experience in a culture fit before I take this person who has a million years of experience. Ah, you said something really good. And that is your company values, right? Like for to establish what the culture is like within the company. A lot of people don't, they, they want to start a business. They go in and jump in <clears throat> and they go make money and learn systems, but they very, very rarely take time to identify their values. And it's really important for decisions like hiring people to see if they're a culture fit. When did you guys establish your company values and why was that important to you? I would say, if I can remember correctly, it was probably maybe six months to a year in. Wow. And again, was, I don't know what I don't know. And then just learning about, okay, culture, we want to create a great culture here. So what does that mean? So then it's revamping our mission statement, our vision statement and our core values. And so when we're hiring even a direct care professional, the entry level position, we're asking guided questions mm. that relates to core values. There you go. That's and good. one thing I think could help a lot of listeners here is maybe even creating the core values, mission and vision statement for their personal life and their family life. Yeah. And I just did that with my wife and it was amazing around board together and having that is huge. And then the business. And this, what's interesting is that you can see a, a big relation, a close relationship between business core values and personal. Cause a lot of times my businesses are an extension of who I am as a person. Absolutely. So true. So key. My wife and I, we establish our 16 family core values. Um, so our kids, as they grow up, they understand and we can implement it in them, right? Like traveling is a kept family value and they love to travel. And so, awesome. it is. <laughs> so, um, so I love that. So awesome. So now you're growing. Did you get time back for you? Yes. Again, my wife was a good indicator of where I'm at <laughs> and where I needed to grow. And the last couple of years, I was able to really step away a lot and evaluate where my strengths and weaknesses are and build my team and trust my team more and more and more. And because I trusted my team, my leadership team, they took over the reins. Like I haven't done payroll in so many years. But keep in mind, too, what's really exciting is that I sold the business and it closed on March 1st of this year. Nice. So how so from beginning to end, how many years was that? I like to, I like to round to 10. It was like nine months. And uh, May 6th is actually 10 year anniversary of Genesis. So Very April, good. May, like nine months or nine years and 10 months. Very cool. So you almost hit that decade mark, mark which very few businesses survive a decade, right? Let alone be profitable enough to sell it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I won't, if, I'm not gonna ask you how much you made. If you wanna share, you absolutely can. However, um, my guess is you sold it for a nice chunk of change and- Well, seven figures, multiple okay. though, yeah. Beautiful. So seven figures, huge you know, income come in. And so what impact has that made on your current life? And where do you go from here? Well, the impact is to finally take a breath, mm. to breathe and try to be still. Part of it is like having God, I'm very faithful and uh, try to have God speak to me, but also just be still. As an entrepreneur, you might be able to relate to this and so can the listeners. It's just go, 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 go. But sometimes taking a step back, you're able to make that quantum leap forward. And that's kind of where I'm at. And what's happening is by being kind of still, like I'm in my workout clothes. I just worked out this morning. Kids are in school, wife's doing whatever. And I'm just relaxing. I'm just trying to chill, not doing much work. It's allowing me to gain clarity. And by gaining clarity, it's going to take me where we want to go. Now, keep in mind, I wanted to get this out because it's very important to me. One of my greatest business acumen is a lot of the awards that I've won running Genesis. I started other businesses like logistics and real estate, but Genesis was my baby. In 2018, I was, uh, I won SBA, so Small Business Administration, Young Entrepreneur of the Year in Michigan. Wow. And that was just amazing. So now I have this resume. Where, so the next avenue is business acquisitions, because that's a skill. It's a 
a gift and the ability that I have is running and operating businesses and growing them and real estate. So I'm going to take a lot of the cash flow from the business, invest in real estate endeavors such as RV parks. We have a, uh, a purchase agreement here in Upper Peninsula of Michigan. We bought a property in Tennessee, but also multifamily, self-storage. But that's going to be the focus uh, moving forward. So collecting assets with that income. Exactly. But trying to enjoy as much time with my family is, is, is the most important. Nice. So the decisions you make when you go invest, because what, what some people may think is like, wow, he made these seven figures. He doesn't have to work. They could go and, you know, take trips and do this and that. But your thought process is I'm not going to just spend the money. It's like, I'm going to invest the money, right? Give you a hard asset that'll be paid down over time. That will, my guess is that you're going to cash flow and cash flow nicely on a monthly basis. So that can provide that freedom lifestyle so that you you can go to the gym, you know, work those arms a little bit, right? <laughs> exactly. And I'm getting clarity. Also having a business coach, I paid a lot of money for, but he's amazing. But it's moving from success to significance. Mm. And what does that actually mean? And so I'm creating a brand and it's a trademark that it's the mid, I'm the middle of. And it's just going to be, it's going to be a book that I have, a podcast, but it's going to be impacting others. So I'm using this as, okay, if you're in an airplane, and the oxygen mask comes down, what do they tell you? Make sure you put it on first. Yep. So now you can help more people. So the business acquisitions and the real estate is just a means to an end. That's going to help fund things that God wants me to fund or help others and then teach others to do the same and then create leaders. So that's kind of the vision moving forward. I love that. You know, if you're watching this right now, and you're sitting there like, oh, I have this great business idea. You know, I, I don't know whether I should move forward. You know, there's there's obviously struggles along the way. And I'll, I'll talk to you here in a minute, Paul, about that. But <clears throat> the goal isn't just to make money, right? That's That's a rung on the ladder of success, right? The goal is to, A, like you said, put your mask on first. Can you create financial freedom for you and your family so you're financially independent that if you have assets that pay you every month, whether it's a, a, you know, dividends from stocks or your portfolio or hard assets like, you know, duplexes, fourplexes, self-storage, all that good stuff, which you're doing, Paul, right? That pays you on a monthly basis, pays your bills and your lifestyle. But then the next rung is about significance, about being able to stop, say, here's where I am. Here's what I've created. And let me lend a hand down. Let me show you how I've done it. And so your ability to turn around and contribute and have that need of contribution met is where your path is now for you and your family. Yes, that's perfectly said. And I'll add to that. I view it as my responsibility mm. as a man to do those things because now it allows me to say, I can spend time with my kids and my wife and I'm not stuck working 60 hours a week at a job that maybe I don't like. See, employee working at a job is not a bad deal. Whatever you want. If you want to start a business, you don't have to be a billionaire, be Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. You may want to make an extra $1,000 to $2,000 a month. And for most people, that pays their rent. Like just imagine now we're in a downswing. Maybe their hours are cut or got laid off, but now they have a couple thousand extra dollars coming in for their business. So you don't have to automatically think of these astronomical becoming a billionaire with your business. Do you think, awesome, I love that. And it's so true, right? Do you think that someone, maybe they're working a nine to five, right? But they have this business idea. What is your recommendation? Do you think quit cold turkey, go all in, you know, do whatever it takes? Do you think it's like, hey, work your job, hustle on the side till you build it up to where you want it to be and then go full time. Like what's your thought process around that? It depends on the support you have. For instance, if, if you're able to quit your job and your wife or spouse, husband can support the family, that might be one way. But our, what I recommend is going at a part-time and then you're going to reach a point as you scale and grow that it might replace your income at your job. And now you have to decide, 
either to quit and go all in with the business or just leave it as is. And that's going to be, I feel to me, I, I went through that with my business and I spoke to other business owners who went with the same. And that's the moment that I can look back on and they look back on and go, I'm so happy. I first of all decided to start, but I decided to go all in once it kind of replaced my W2 income. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, there's a great book called The Originals out there. And they talk about this philosophy, or well, not this philosophy, they actually did research and they took two control groups, right? One quit their job cold turkey, went all in on their business. The other one worked their nine to five, worked the business on the side. Uh, I forget what the time period was, but what they found as at the end of the study, right? The group that quit cold turkey, as you would imagine, or maybe you didn't, they were less successful than the group that worked their nine to five. <laughs> and my, and I just by working with so many people over the years, I really believe it's because they, they can, they watch their income. If they're not, their business isn't producing the way they want. They're watching their savings dwindle down. Things aren't moving. They're getting stressed. They're making decisions out of fear, right? They're trying to force instead of seeing if it actually aligns or it's a, you know, it's a good culture fit. And so I could see why the outcomes are the way they are versus the other side, right? Like there's no stress, their bills are paid, but they are able to fund it quicker and, and take more time. So anyway, love your answer there. So awesome. So you start this, this business at 23, you know, fast forward almost 10 years later, you sell it for seven figures, you're on your journey, you know, from this point forward on what you're creating and the impact you want to make. On that 10 year journey, I'd love for you to just share, you know, what was one of maybe one of your biggest challenges? And how did you overcome it? Because, you know, we all know success is in a straight line, right? It's, it's like, you know, it's, it's ups and downs. But so what was one of your biggest challenges? And how did you overcome it? I would say one of them would be imposter syndrome and imposter syndrome is not feeling like I was good enough or I deserved the success or I even earned the success. Like, Oh, young entrepreneur of the year. Oh, really? Really? Like, how did I get that? And not feeling value. And so it goes back to the mind, mind shift, mind frame that I worked on a lot, a lot of reading, a lot of videos. And so owning a business and it makes me, it made me grow as a person. That's one thing a lot of business owners I don't think talk about is how it makes you grow as a person. Yeah. In some instances, it has a negative effect. It could maybe you're spending too much time in your business and it affects your family. In this case, it helped my family. It helped me grow. And so that mind shift of imposter syndrome to, hey, I'm worthy enough. I'm doing God's work. This is what's for me. This is my path is what really impacted me. And mm -hmm. the obstacle, one of the obstacles of many that I had to overcome. No, I love that. It, it's so true. It, like the what you know, growing and in, in the beginning, I think a lot of us, not all, but a lot of us in the beginning have that imposter syndrome, right? Like they, they like, who am I to have all this success mm -hmm. and this money and, you know, or to be looked up as this or win this award. Right. And so it is something. <clears throat> and one of the things that I, I really truly have done and, and coach people around and believe in is really just ha visualizing yourself to that point of success where you're so comfortable from the inside out, because what happens is we try to get comfortable from the outside in and that becomes a, a it becomes it feels like you're being the imposter but when you can live that like for example if I'm walking down the street you know with my boys right if I have a goal of being this loving generous giving multi-billionaire one day I have to check in am I walking how a billionaire would walk well how would I feel if I was a billionaire right now right and it's like I I, I stand up taller I feel more confident I feel more loving and generous right and it just makes a deeper connection with my boys right so um I I love that now here you are you're building a business um you have a family wife one child or two or three how many three. kids three, three kids okay how does someone build a business to be successful to grow to seven figures and then also be able to be this great husband, this great father to three kids. Like, how do you, how did you navigate that? 
So something I actually learned recently that I want to be able to share is have compassion for yourself. So say to yourself, it's okay. Today was a rough day. Maybe you know, just give yourself permission to be imperfect mm, and to so learn. Good. Now, I think being on the same page with your significant other is going to be key. For a while, my wife, my wife was a stay-at-home mom. That helped greatly. And they were really young. Like they just started school. My daughter now is in you know, third grade and my son's in kindergarten. And our nice. youngest son is not even in school yet. So that's a, uh, that's a lot of work too. But without having my wife, it probably would have been possible. However, I believe anything is possible. So maybe I would have found a way. But the biggest deal is to systemize your life. We talk about systemizing a business. There's also creating those habits that you can systemize or become second nature to you. So you might say, okay, I know that in my day at from 6 to 7.30, I have time to work on my business. So just like you wake up and eat breakfast or brush your teeth before you go to bed, part of what you become is working on your business. And so I think building that into, especially being a busy professional that wants to build a business, just build that into your routine. It's going to be tough, but I think that's going to be the biggest key for your success. Yeah, that's, that's so good. And there's so many challenges with that because so many people at times as they're building their business and they're building their business with the intention of providing a great life for their family, their spouse, their children. But sometimes the partner is not always on board mm -hmm. and that creates a whole nother obstacle. And it sounds like your wife was on board, um, but she also saw the fruits of your labor too. Right. And yes. so which helps, but it's beautiful that you have such a great partner that's connected and supported you. Some people aren't that lucky. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't always that way either. So no. we had to grow and grow through it. But again, it's just communication with your wife and continue to try to align the value. So like my goal is become, it's our goal. Her goals are my goal as well. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's so good. So healthy too. It's such a healthy approach um, when you can align like that. So that's awesome. Really exciting to hear kind of your journey and what you've created and to where you are today. And we know each other through GoBundance, right? And I just wanted to ask you, why did you join the GoBundance Mastermind? Like, what was it for you? What were you looking to get out of it? So I read the book. And why does the title, I forgot the title, but it was an amazing book. And I wanted to be with like-minded people because being a millionaire, being someone who has a business and having hundreds of employees, between all my businesses at its peak, it was over 300 employees, you know, from 250 to 300 employees. I wanted to be around like-minded people, but it was really authentic relationships that I wanted to build. And that's what attracted me to Go Abundance. And now that I'm part of Go Abundance, just meeting so many people that a lot of times, sometimes we don't even talk about money or business. It's family or it's adventures. That's what I love about Go Abundance. But of course, it's also like minded people that are so smart in business and real estate that that's another, just another added value to Go Abundance. Oh, yeah. And I think a book you were talking or referring to was Tribe of Millionaires, correct? Thank you. Thank you. Tribe of Millionaires. If, yes. I, if you haven't read that book, everyone that's listening, please check it out on Audible. I probably listen to it once a week. Um, yeah, I said it right. Once a week. Now, the whole book, no, but more towards the end, uh, I listen to it because it just reconnects me to the purpose of why I joined the mastermind. I've gotten so much value out of it. And like you said, the authentic relationships, I'm about to head to Miami here in a few days for an event with GoBundance and looking forward to connecting with people um, down there. And it's just, it, if you're ever interested, reach out, uh, let them know I sent you, but it is a great community of men and they have one for women too. So if you're a woman listening to this, you could actually join too. Um, and, but if you're a spouse, of someone that's in it, they can also participate. So do your own research, but Go Bundance is it's added so much value to me in just the four months that I've been in. So excited about continuing on the journey. All right, yeah, before we wrap up, I, want, I got a couple of questions here. Name, who was one of the biggest impact like mentor wise for you on your journey? <laughs> wow. I think 
one would be my dad indirectly he passed away uh when i was 28 years old but i wanted to make him proud i wanted to make a name for myself i know he was proud of me so i think my dad would be one i didn't have a lot of male influence that's another reason why i enjoyed go abundance and actually one of my business coaches now i have a couple but one in particular is amazing through go abundance mm -hmm. uh, but there are i really look to a lot of dead people like one of my heroes i guess i call him that is benjamin franklin and he had he inspired me and there are different things that i take like even alexander the great i'm not saying he's the greatest guy in the world but in terms of his strategy and conquering different countries like what was his strategy what was his mindset so i'm thinking about strategic i try to like have my own mastermind group of individuals and then take their mentality or try to be in their position say what would they do doing like say acquiring a business what would they look at so benjamin franklin is probably one of the biggest influences of my life that is no longer living i love it i love it um obviously most people hear benjamin franklin they know who he is you say he's a big influence just tell the audience what's one nugget about him that influences you so much well besides being brilliant and being a business owner one of the things that a lot of people don't know about Benjamin Franklin, well, I can give you two nuggets. Go. So he actually started a mastermind way back in the day when people got together. It was called like the Brown Apron Group or something like that. Another word of like conjunto, which is like Latin for to join together. So him and other folks would meet every so often. And it was like one of the first masterminds. It was pretty cool stuff. The second part is his brilliance in terms of people. He's the reason why America won the Revolutionary War because they had to finance this war. The America had to finance this war, they, they couldn't. And so he went, went over to France and was able to have France finance the war for us. And he was conflicted because he grew up in Britain and he was, came to America, so he was like this dual Citizen, and he was really conflicted, but ultimately he stuck with what he believed was right. And I think that was a uh, just the way he was able to do that. He understood people was amazing. That's awesome. Maybe you're inspiring some people to check out his autobiography and we'll study him a little bit more. There's a show on PBS right now, too. Oh, yeah. What's it called? I don't know. Just look on Netflix and go look up Benjamin Franklin. It's like a two part series. Okay, got it. Oh. <laughs> Which I, names of certain things, like names of people I can remember, but other stuff I'm just like, oh, I know, I know, I'll look for it and find it. I'll have to find it somewhere else. I'm uh, at this stage of the game. I am uh, no longer a Disney or a uh, Netflix person um, due to some beliefs that they hold. So conflicting with my beliefs and values, but exactly. I'm sure it's out there. You I'm right behind you. I'm right behind you on that, by the way. Awesome. Yeah. Some people may not be, and that's okay. Yeah. But all right. Um, last question around content before we wrap up. What is one of the most impactful books you've ever read and why? It would have to be The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Mm. Um I'm thinking of the author is again why I don't know why I always go blank with stuff. Um, amazing, but he also wrote like the 5 a.m. club, uh, sharp. I I'll try to think of it. But the reason why is because he used this analogy where there was this attorney who had had a heart attack and he ended up selling everything, became like a monk. And then he taught his protege that was at the law firm the principles he learned. And it changed his life, just being able to talk about the now and that journey that where he was until where we ended up being because of these principles uh, impacted his life. And that when I wrote that read that book, I was kind of like in the same boat of. And by the way, his name is Robin Sorshoma. Yeah, I believe. Yep. He I, I feel like I was going to just like I have a heart attack or a stroke. So I'm just moving so fast. But sometimes being still is so key. And so that book really spoke to me and the principles. Um, I'm also being in the now and just talking about gratitude 
and it has a whole type of like a couple of things that you can do each day to help you along your path. Wow, that's so good. And being still so important and is really hard for a lot of the high performers that I coach. But I always say the answers you seek are at the bottom of a pond. The challenge for most entrepreneurs and high performers is they're in the pond, splashing, creating things, moving. It's until they stop and don't move and settle and calm that the water can settle and eventually see the answer at the bottom, right? Mm-hmm. And so stillness is such a, is so important. And, you know, I think I may have done a, a, pot, a, vi- a show on that or a, a, a video on it, excuse me, and if not, I need to, but, and I'm sure we could sit here and talk about the benefits of that all day, uh, but that is so key. And that is such a great book. So if you haven't read it, Robin Sharma, uh, the monk who sold his Ferrari, we'll put it in the show notes for you, but very, very good book. And what a, good referral right there that you just shared so awesome well tell us how can people follow you learn more about you if you even want any of that <laughs> yes yeah i'll give you my old email i'm creating this brand as trademark or i'll give you all of that um but my email is p gallagher p-g-a-l-l-a-g-h-e-r-88 at yahoo.com and yeah please reach out ask any questions in the future, you'll see me, I'll have a book out uh, within the next three years, but a podcast um, and my whole entire brand that does the business acquisition so you can invest with us in real estate, but also we're gonna be giving back. Whether it be churches, education, leadership development. So you'll learn, you'll see that as uh, time goes on, that whole mark once the trademark comes through. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm excited to see more of that. Congrats to you and all your business success, your life success, but that's what Master Life by Design is all about. You've took a different, you took a different path. You have some key things like real estate in there. Business is an asset. People, I want you guys to understand owning a business is an asset, right? Um, As long as you're making money, hopefully. (laughs) You're making money, but your taxes don't show money being made. That's a whole different story. We'll talk about that another time. Um, But Paul, thank you for being here. Very, very excited to hear your journey. It's a different twist to what people may be accustomed to or even thinking about doing. Maybe they're on their path or their journey and just your story inspired them. So appreciate you taking your time out and joining us on the show today. I'm honored uh, that you had me today. Well, thank you. Well, everyone, this wraps up this episode. So thank you all for joining. Tune in. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, that notification button, so you're notified when uh, videos like this come out so that you can get all the content, knowledge, bombs that we have to offer here at Master Life by Design. So till the next one, everyone, have a great day and enjoy. See ya. See ya.